One. So good, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the YR webinar. The floor is yours, Hedia. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this YR uh, webinar. I'm Hedia, and I will be the host of uh, today's webinar. So today we will have the pleasure to learn about how to run uh, our R script in the cloud. We have the pleasure to have with us Rule Hogerhorst. But before introducing our speaker, we want to uh, we want you to let us know from which part of the globe you're from. So please, can you put in the chat box your country, and then you put hello from, and then your country, please. So it will be nice to see uh, how big our community is. Uh, thank you, Rule. So now. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Rule Hogerworth. So Rule is a maker. He loves uh, build useful machine learning tools uh, for people, and uh, he loves also sharing these tools and what he learned. So uh, he has been working in researcher as a data scientist and a machine learning uh, engineer roles for the past years. So um, Rule wants to make it easier and convenient and simple for everyone uh, to run their R uh, script in the cloud. So how do you get your R script to run? Uh, in this talk, Rule wants to inspire lone data scientists on all the way he, uh, so they can uh, run their script in the cloud. He will be covering some simple and more advanced use cases for running uh, R in the cloud. Uh, we will be talking also about cooperating with IT for maximum results. Uh, thank you, Rul, uh, for uh, uh, joining us today. And uh, the screen is yours. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. So, um, yeah, hello. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about uh, running your R script in the cloud. Um, uh, so this is supposed to be inspiration. Um, I will show you several things that I think are um, useful. And I will show you a lot of links to stuff that I've created before and uh, examples that I've created. Um, and so let me just take a step back. Uh, it's not just about typing R code. Um, it, what I care about is you have a business problem and you have some sort of exploratory R script. And in this uh, presentation, I will show you how to make it slightly better, and uh, ultimately how to make it work. And um, yeah, I'm going to be referring to a lot of my previous work uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, throw them in the chat and uh, we will pick them up. And you can also 
send me messages uh, and I will, uh, I have all of the links that I've used in this presentation. Uh, I've put them all into a, a repository. And so uh, you don't have to screenshot it or uh, type it over. I have links everywhere. All right. So uh, yeah, something about me. Um, uh, I've been blogging uh, mostly about our stuff since 2016. And um, well, uh, one of the things I've created is a, uh, uh, when the, the image magic package uh, came out, I created a, a stupid tool to add uh, dancing banana gifs to uh, pictures. So you see one example here. And uh, uh, all right, uh, I work for Ordina and uh, this is not a sponsored talk, um, uh, but I do want to mention that uh, we are hiring and uh, uh, Ordina has a lot of experience in getting your idea uh, from uh, just the idea phase into a production ready product. Um, so if you're interested uh, to know more about this, uh, Ordina is a very large IT consultant in the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, just contact me or go to one of these, um, uh, one of these addresses. All right, now I'm going to uh, when I when I thought about this talk, I envisioned um, an audience, and my audience is I think that you are um, a lone data scientists. You are a professional. You know um, exactly uh, what is going on in a company, and um, you do know how to program, but you're not a software engineer. You're not used to writing software, but you do know how to program. And the main point is you have little to no support from an IT or data engineering team. I have a story of how you could have come in this position. So in this story, this is Charles. Charles is the CEO of the company. And um, Charles is thinking, you know what? We have a pretty big database. So that means we have big data. And since big data is the new oil, that means we are rich. The only thing that we need is we need to hire a data scientist just to extract all of this value. And so that's the reason why a data scientist is hired. And you as a data scientist, you're a smart person. So you look into the company, you realize, okay, there are several problems that are both useful and valuable to solve and I think I can do it. First step is you find out how are we currently solving it. And then on your computer, you download, uh, you, you create, maybe you talk to the database, you extract some data, put it into a data set, create a model, uh, make some predictions, and then uh, you check it against the benchmark and it seems like you're better uh, than the benchmark. So now is the question, how do we continue from here? And so um, the CEO hears this, he's very, very happy. He says, okay, make it work, goodbye. Uh, and so you end up uh, talking to the IT people or the operations people. You ask them, um, I have this script here, uh, it needs to run. Can you make this happen for me? And what often happens is they have a lot of questions. What do you mean this solves a problem? What kind of access do you need? What kind of resources do you need? And this kind of questioning can become bothersome. And you might think, you know what? I'll just do it myself. I know some, uh, I know some stuff. I watched a talk by uh, Ru, and so I think I'll just follow one of his links and then I'll just fix it myself. Please don't do that. You can do it, but do it maybe as a last ditch effort. I want you to warn against this because what you're then creating is what we call shadow IT. And shadow IT is not a good thing. Uh, some examples of shadow IT are uh, Excel sheets that drive the entire business, uh, but they live on someone's uh, drive on a computer. So if that computer breaks, suddenly the entire company breaks. Uh, or maybe you set up some uh, cloud-based things because you thought, well, if I have to wait for my manager, then it will take forever. 
or maybe you have a lot of customized code to deal with all of the edge cases and you need to copy that code to all of your new projects. Or maybe you have an R script that just runs on your laptop and it seems to work. Uh, so you, need, you run this every day. So there are better uh, ways to do these things. So for example, Excel sheets are better uh, replaced by database tables or some stored procedure or some other tools. Um, and it's really not a good idea to put things on your own name in a cloud account. This is something that needs to be controlled by an IT department because they can handle the security and the logging and all of these stuff. And so uh, for our case, the specific case of an, uh, uh, your R script, we also need to think about this. How do we make sure that it becomes integrated into the company? So let me revise the goal a bit. Get your stuff to work <laughs> where it provides value, because if it doesn't provide value, then what are you doing it for? And also don't create shadow IT. And it's all about effective collaboration, about talking the talk. So because these frustrations are very common. Uh, when I talk to them, they don't have time or uh, maybe next month. Or I have to be so specific that it just, I, I stop bothering. Or I'm not even allowed to do basic stuff. I can't do anything. And we need to get into the mindset of the operations people so that we understand their concerns and that so that we um, uh, can deal with these concerns and we can talk about it. And uh, I'm very inspired by the why are number five talk by Lorenzo Bersci. Uh, he had a wonderful description of the mindset in operations versus uh, data scientists and um, uh, how these things um, sometimes cause issues and how to uh, get it better. So uh, what I want to focus on is, so what do the IT and operations people care about? They focus on stability, security, and other corporate requirements. That has a good reason. They focus on stability because they don't want to maintain a lot of stuff. And if you don't have to, uh, if you, uh, if you don't um, have to put in a lot of time in maintaining some stuff, then you have time for other other things, for creating new uh, products. And uh, in security, they don't want any account to do anything. Uh, they want specific accounts with very specific scopes. So that if one breaks, if one is uh, taken over by a bad actor, then it doesn't ruin the entire company. And maybe you think uh, all of these requirements are stupid, but sometimes they're just, uh, they're just a law. And sometimes they're best practices. I think IT people uh, also have some fears. They have fears that when you turn up with your script, that they will become a help desk and they have to help you every day. And sometimes they worry that they have to re-implement your entire thing in another language. Or maybe don't, uh, but maybe not, but they have to debug your code. And of course, everyone is also a bit scared uh, for credential leakage. And uh, no one wants to end up in the have I been pwned database that contains uh, email addresses of uh, largest breaches in the world. So, for example, um, in, in the case of stability, um, in an ideal world, a static, beautiful world that never happens, uh, nothing changes. And so we set all of the requirements, we make sure that everything is as it is, and we fix it, we hammer it down, and it just works. Maybe you as a data scientist want to have the latest version. And you realize, you know what? If I now take the R development version, I don't have to specify that I want strings as factors true because it's by default true instead of, uh, it's, it's false instead of true. Anyway, you get what I mean. You want the fastest performance, you want the latest functionality, but this also means that if it changes and you always take the latest version, that uh, your code breaks. So what you need to do is you, you need to find a balance so that you and the uh, uh, operations people work together. You can produce something of value. 
I think the most important thing to do is to talk about the common goal. Uh, the common goal, for instance, we want a better forecast of sales. And uh, my solution is actually doing this. And so you're helping me providing more value to the company and therefore please help. So this is very important and something that I uh, often forget or forgot in, uh, in the past. Talk to all of your people, talk to, talk to not only your manager, but also the operations people and talk to them from the start to give them a, a general idea of what you're going to do and uh, what kind of uh, resources you need. And you, you can let them know that you are an equal partner and that you will maintain the code and uh, that you will do your best to also honor the stability and security of the company. And so there's even some words you can use. So instead of saying, I want a laptop in the cloud, say something like, I would like a virtual machine. And instead of calling it an R script, because it is an R script, but it's, it's more, it's a program, call it a program. And instead of saying, no, all of this work will slow me down, say something like, this kills my velocity. Then they know that you are in the same team. All right, so maybe it's more practical if I give you an example. So I'm starting with a very exploratory script, or maybe you start with an R markdown document, and uh, you found out uh, what the best uh, operations were, and now you realize, okay, you're only taking the pieces that are necessary, and we're going to turn that into a more mature program. So this is a speed course in becoming a software engineer. This is the case. So uh, in your company, you want to forecast the sales for tomorrow. First, we need to realize what is the current state of the art? What are we currently using? In this company, currently we're using uh, yesterday's sales is going to be tomorrow's sales. It's not perfect. It works kind of. Um, and so you as a data scientist uh, want to do a lot of stuff, but maybe first start on a very simple scale. So your proposal is, let's take the average over six days because you figured out six days is a nice average that has a, has a good value. And um, not only is it better, you can also give some uncertainty. And um, uh, so, th so th that would be super cool. And the CEO can now say, we use machine learning to reduce our uncertainty about future. So let me just go over the code real quick. First in words, then in some code. Uh, first, we load the libraries, we get today's date, we make a connection to the database, retrieve the last seven days of sales, make a forecast by taking the average, and then write back to the table. So in code, this looks like this. We load the DBI library, which talks to all of the databases in the, in the world, practically all of them, um, do a connection, uh, create a query, put the query into the, uh, into the database, get the results back, create a forecast, and uh, write it back into the table. And now, the first step is to make sure that the script actually runs. So go out of the R session or go into the terminal, and type in R script and then the name of your script and then run the, run the process. It happens a lot that that actually doesn't work. So you need to fix it to make sure that that works. It needs to work autonomously. The next step is to uh, move secrets out of the script, stop with hard coding them. The second step is error quickly. The third step is add some logging. And finally, I will show you some cool things that you can do with RN. Um, yeah, so I put in some secrets into my code. And this is, uh, this is a problem. So as you can see, you can now see my username and uh, very cool password. But what if the password changes? Well, then you need to change the script. Also, uh, when you execute the script, 
all of these uh, lines are going to come into the uh, our history file. And that's probably not a good idea. So one of the easiest ways to deal with this is to put these secrets into environmental variables. And uh, IT people are very familiar with these things and you can even create machines that already have some of these uh, secrets, these environmental variables in the computer. And so, uh, Locally, you can create a file. It's called the .rnviron file. And it works like this. You just write the name of the variable, an equal sign, and then the thing that needs to go in there. And, uh, and, and in the script, I change the, uh, the hard-coded secret and just say, give it, give it the, this environmental variable to look for. And then at the moment it executes this, it will figure out what that, num what that name is and then uh, replace it while it's running. And this is very cool because this also, um, this also uh, creates, it creates for you the possibility to have different secrets and different uh, passwords in different environments. So maybe if you want to run it in production, you need different credentials. You don't have to uh, change your script. The next step is error quickly. So it's still the same script, but there's some uh, steps here. So uh, I try to find the, uh, the username and then try to find the password. And if it's not there, I turn it to missing. The next step is do a check. Are any of these things missing? Because I know if I don't have a password or don't have a username, then the entire process will fail. And so fail early. We don't want to wait until we end up at the third line or somewhere deep inside the, the, the query to the database, because then we have to trace back all the way from where did this error actually happen. So if you know that something will fail at a certain point, fail at that moment and fail loudly and also fail clearly. In this case, when I, uh, when I hit stop, this is the mess message that will also come back into the screen or into the console. So this will help you a lot. It's, it's sort of a defensive programming. Prevent yourself from shooting in yourself in the foot. Uh, thirdly, log all of the useful things. So in this case, it's still the same function that the uh, call that finds out if any of the password or usernames are missing. But right before I terminate the script, I also log an error. And if you use a, a logging um, a framework, like uh, logit or uh, logger, uh, it, you can also write it to a file. And then it doesn't matter where the, uh, the machine um, executes, but you can uh, output that log file to somewhere and then uh, people in operations are familiar with log files and they can return it back to you or you can make some, um, you can make some, some deals about how you want to do, deal with this. And so not only errors, but also useful things like uh, useful debugging steps, like how many rows did I get back from the sales table? So in this case, I uh, call the log info file, uh, a log info um, function, and it tells me exactly in the log how many rows were, were released, <clears throat> were retrieved. Finally, fix your package versions with ARM. This brings us closer to the idealized world where every package is fixed and stuck and it will never change. Well, it might change, but at least uh, using the ARM package, you can make sure that the package versions that you used on your computer are also the ones that are used on another computer. It's very simple. I really recommend you to go to the website and just try it out. Uh, and in our studio, there's actually even a button where you can uh, uh, where you can highlight it, and it will work with a new project. So what it does is you snapshot. So while you're busy in your project, you might think, okay, this seems like a good point. Then you snapshot, and uh, it writes in a file, uh, uh, rnf.log file. It writes down exactly what versions and where it came from, where all the packages came from. And then in a new program, you can use rnf restore. And it will install exactly that those packages again in that computer in a specific library for this project. And this will uh, alleviate a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of problems that are sometimes hard to debug, like, wait, so in the tidy R package of that version, that 
that function that you called is no longer available and stuff like that is very, very difficult and tricky to find out. But if you fix it with RNF, then it makes it a lot easier to run and to debug. So this leads to more stable packages. Uh, you provide some better security by using environmental variables. And uh, you can log informative messages that are also useful for uh, operations people. And you can also tell your operations people, okay, you do not have to implement an entire solution. My thing works and I will own it. And if it breaks, it is my responsibility. Come to me and I will try to fix it. Uh, <clears throat> and the logs will help you in debugging. So finally, let's get some stuff into the cloud. You might think, Rule, why did you take almost 20 minutes to talk about all of this stuff. Well, all I wanted to know was how to get this stuff into the cloud to work. Well, it's very important that you make your program reproducible and stable because all the new errors that come up now are probably caused by the cloud solution and no longer by your script alone. So you can split these things out and at least make sure that it all works. So let's take a step back. So how can you run code automatically? I see that there are, in my mind, there are three different ways to do it. You can schedule it on your own computer. You can schedule it on another computer and that computer can be in the cloud or it can be a local machine or can be other, at least it's another computer. Or you use a different service that doesn't even care where you don't even care what type of computer it is. You just say, okay, this is the code, run this. Uh, some examples are uh, scheduler services like uh, Airflow, or uh, you can have GitHub, GitLab, Heroku. Uh, and I will show some of these examples. Uh, I also made a pro and con of most of these things uh, that I think are important, and you can look at that uh, as well. You can find it on this link. Now, run it on your own computer. This is a big risk because now you have to maintain this too. Uh, but it's also very easy. If you use Windows, you can use Stas Scheduler. If you use uh, Linux or Mac or any of these uh, uh, types, you can use Chrome. And there are also R packages that will help you uh, create these, uh, these files to make this work. So for instance, here you have a, a, an example from the Chrome package, the Chrome R package, and you can just tell it, okay, run it, uh, every 15 minutes from this date. And uh, this is the R script and uh, yeah, make it work. And um, then you don't forget about it as well. It just runs every day. The problem is your computer needs to be on and um, yeah, your, your computer needs to be on. So if you're on vacation, then it doesn't run. So maybe you want to run it on another computer. Now, there are cheap options, very cheap options. Like a Raspberry Pi is a complete Linux computer and you can install R on it and, uh, and it runs just fine. Uh, or maybe there is a spare server somewhere, but uh, maybe you're more interested in the cloud machines. If your company or university is already using some sort of cloud solution, then you can also make use of a virtual machine, a laptop in the cloud. Now, all of these um, uh, big uh, cloud companies give these things different names. I think the Microsoft one is still the closest to what it actually is, but uh, the Amazon cloud, for instance, calls it Elastic Compute Cloud. Don't let it confuse you. These are just virtual machines. These are just computers in the cloud. And uh, again, this is something that you can talk about with your uh, operations people. They understand VMs, they know how this works, and they can also make sure that you follow some of their best practices. Uh, yeah, and the, some, some positive points, the computer is always on. So even if you're on vacation, it works. The, some negative points are, it's always on. You pay for every second that it's on. And so if you use a virtual machine to run one script uh, every week, then might be better to use something else. 
because then for most of the week, it's not doing anything, but you're still paying for it. So what are some other options? You have a thing that they call serverless or function as a service, where you only pay for the execution. And so if you only run once a week, then you only pay for the few seconds that it runs once a week. And in most of these cloud services, you have a lot of free time that you can use. And you can run in response to things like a web request or a new user. Uh, another option is to run it through the cloud version control things. You have uh, GitHub Actions that can run stuff automatically, and you have GitLab CI that also does the same thing. And there's things like uh, Heroku or Circle CI, so, some other options. Most of these things require a Docker container. And so I'll do a small detour into Docker containers. So you need to think about Docker containers as a lightweight Linux system and you combine it with your script and then you can deliver this entire package to someone else and say, okay, you make it run. And the cool thing is that if it runs on your computer, then it will also run on someone else's computer because you make sure that everything, uh, all of the layers that are necessary are already there. So here's an example uh, in one of my uh, cloud examples. Um, so I'm going through some of the lines here. I'm using the Rocker container. So there's a special R project for Docker. And it has very, uh, it, so this is the most bare version. It's just R version 4.02. So if you need version 4.5, uh, then you can specify 4.5. There is no 4.5 yet, but in future, there will be. So the first line, these are just instructions. Take this basic uh, layer, then update it, then install the RNF package. Then you need to install some uh, system requirements, and uh, which I haven't specified here, but it's necessary to do this. Uh, so if you want to install, install DeepLayer, uh, you need to install some, some other stuff. Then I copy the rnf log file that I created in the previous step, copy that to the container, then tell uh, the R process, okay, install all of these packages. So you don't have to specify install this package, install that package, install that package. No, just say and restore, and it will just install all of these packages. Finally, I uh, copy the, the actual job that I want to run, and then it executes the job. And so when someone else builds this container and runs it, it will do the job that I wanted to run. There are some tools to help you with this. So the Rocker project has many, many, many links and many examples of how, how you can do things. And there is the container it package, which will also uh, create a, a Docker file for you. It will help you with your Docker file. And uh, the, I think, there are some packages for the uh, cloud run. It's, it's in the Google Cloud, and that will also do a lot of work for you. So uh, I have some examples. I've created these uh, uh, yeah, some time ago. And um, it's a really stupid example, but it has visible output. So what I did is I created a Twitter bot that creates a shape that's always an inverted U shape. I pick some random labels, put them on there, create a ggplot image, and post that to Twitter. It's a stupid example, but it has many things that you might like in a, in a, a software solution. It, you need to store your credentials safely to talk to Twitter. You talk to an API over the internet. Uh, I fixed all of the packages with RNF, and I also log to the, uh, to the service what I uh, all of the things that I do. And so, well, the end result is these stupid pictures It with slightly different colors and, uh, and also a, a label where it came from. And I will give you some examples. Oh. Right. So uh, this is one example for the GitLab CI. And what you do for GitLab is you need to specify in a document all of the steps that need to go. So 
you can forget about most of this. I also wrote a blog post about this that you can, uh, that you can read. There are two steps that are important. I built a container in the build stage, push it into a registry, and then in the test stage at the bottom, I pull, uh, I pull down that, uh, uh, that, that container again, and then I run it and I supply it all of the secrets that I put into GitLab. So I'm using the environmental variables here uh, and I supply them through uh, GitLab. And this runs every day, as you might see in the picture. I did the same thing for GitHub. Um, in here, yeah. So some of the some of the, the the ways you need to code this are slightly different between GitHub and GitLab, and you need to see a few examples, and then you can do it yourself. But in here, uh, I do sort of the same things. Uh, check out the package. Uh, check out the latest code. Uh, install rn then uh, install the dependencies that I needed. And finally, I restore all the entire library and then I run the R script. This is bad. I had many stupid examples of the, uh, of the, the things that I created. So there's one for Azure serverless. So that runs on the Microsoft cloud. And that makes use of the, a timer trigger. And it just, uh, so once a day, it calls that uh, Docker container and then it lives for a few seconds to create this entire, this stupid uh, picture and post it to Twitter. And then uh, it dies again. So I only have to pay for the few seconds a day that it's alive. And the same thing for Heroku. It, it's a similar service, um, but it takes more, um, more of your problems away. It, it abstracts a lot for uh, away for you. And so it works uh, quite, I mean, it's, it's, it's super simple to set up um, and it works really, really brilliantly. And then I have another GitLab example, but okay, uh, these uh, apparently these pictures were too big or there was something wrong with them, but it's the same idea with uh, just Stupid pictures and then some uh, some names. So, uh, yeah, I think my conclusions are: talk to your operations people, talk to all of the stakeholders right from the start. Let them know. <coughs> let them know what you want to achieve, and let them know that you understand that uh, stability, security are also important to you. Um, make sure that your R script is portable. Make sure that it runs uh, almost uh, automatically and uh, that it runs on other computers as well. And uh, you can make use of these modern cloud solutions. I have two more slides. Um, so yeah, for stability, you can use the RN package to fix the package versions. You can even use Docker to make an entirely fixed operating system. It's an entire package that you can just hand over to someone else and say, okay, run this. Um, yeah, there are some ideas. Think about uh, communication, uh, restricting access, and make sure that you're using accounts that are have just enough rights to just do the thing that you want to do and nothing else. Um, and yeah, so maybe you're thinking, you showed me three examples, what should I use? Um, I'm not going to give you definite advice, but I will show you what you need to think about. So if you have one script and it runs only on working hours, then maybe the first step is to just use your own machine. But keep in mind that you don't want to create a whole shadow IT. So if you have multiple uh, scripts, then maybe you want to think about a different permanent solution that even works if you're not there. So if you have multiple scripts, then maybe look into things like uh, GitLab or GitHub or Heroku. These are some of these services that do a lot of stuff for you and automate it away. If you start to have multiple scripts or stuff that needs to run every hour or something, then it might be worth it to uh, run a virtual machine or your, your, or your own server. Um, because then it becomes uh, relatively easily cheaper to run your own machine. 
And finally, if you have a very complex logic, you might want to look into different things, but then you also need to talk to more data engineering people. Uh, and then you, there's, there's some solutions like Airflow that do a lot of automatic thing, things, uh, create a lot of um, uh, uh, pipelines. And there, there are many options for this, but yeah, you're in a whole different game at that point. And uh, specifically, if you want your code to respond to something, then you might want to look into function as a service. So this is all my stuff. I put all of the links into a, uh, a GitHub repository. I even created an overview page of all of the blog posts that I wrote about different ways to schedule your scripts. And um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rune. So we have uh, nine questions. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. So the first question is, are notebooks like Jupyter a major part of the shadow IT in data science? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, uh, like our markdown books or Jupyter books, uh, they can be a, they can be shadow IT. I've, I've seen several solutions that automatically run Jupyter notebooks. Um, but I think after a certain point, so the, these notebooks are super useful. And uh, it's it's wonderful because you can see the result of visualizations. And so they're, they're very useful. But if you want to uh, run more performant uh, things, then I think you need to go back to either Python scripts when you're using a Jupyter notebook uh, or uh, R scripts if you're running R uh, things. I think that makes it easier to maintain and easier uh, easier to change. So it can be it can be a shadow IT. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the second question is: uh, Does RAM versionize also software that is not related to R, like dependent Python packages used uh, with an R project? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because sometimes you have an entire R project that's also making use of uh, Reticulate to talk to Python, uh, or maybe you use the, the uh, Torch project. I don't think that's using Python. But um, yeah, uh, I believe uh, but you need to check the RN website yourself. I believe they also version the Python versions. Yes. Um, and so that's super useful. Yeah. I believe it does. It's my final answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so do uh, our environ loads automatically or does it need to be loaded so somehow? Ah, so yes. R oh. R R yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good. Qu so the question is something like, um, uh, I showed you something about the environmental variables and, a, and the dot r r environ file. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and and the question is so does it load automatically or do I need to do something specifically? So these uh, when you start a new R session, it loads the r environ file uh, that's in the same location. And there, the whole R startup is a very interesting, um, uh, interesting process. But you, all you need to remember is yes, if you put it next to that script and you start it in that directory, then it will load all of these uh, uh, variables. But to access these variables, you need to use the uh, get get env uh, function to retrieve the value that that's in there. Yeah, so the other question is the variable stored in the dot r environment file are loaded to r when r starts up. You then access. Oh, I think, with, I think uh, we answered this one already. Okay. No, because uh, uh, there are two. Questions. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah sorry. but uh, maybe <laughs> it's about the same, you know? Because, yeah, yeah so maybe it's about the same. The other yeah. question is uh, what's the difference between. Uh, RAM uh, restore and RAM hydrate. Hydrate. Uh, I don't actually know what the difference is. I always use restore. Uh, 
I I have to look this up to give you a good answer. This I believe the website actually gives uh, great examples of how this works. I don't know from the top of my head how this uh, what the difference is between these two things. Okay, so the other question: uh, How to restart uh, Aram Veron after I made changes uh, to the file during our session? Oh yeah, so you want to know if if I change this file. How do I, uh, yeah, how do I reload it? I, th well, the best way is to make sure that it's very easy to restart your R session. Uh, I think it's a very good habit to just regularly restart the R session. Uh, it, because then you also make sure that things are operated to in the same, or operated in the same order. Um, and so, well, okay, so <clears throat> if you know what, what thing you want to put in there, you can also manually put something into the, um, into the, uh, what's it called? Into the, the, the system uh, environmental variables. You also have a sys.setenv, and then you, set, you, you can set something uh, during the session. And so, if you don't want to restart the entire session, it's also possible to manually set it. Uh, any tips to how to properly learn how to set up RM? I struggled with the official docs. My friends who are not from the NIT background really struggle with versions and updates with uh, their R script. Oh. Well, that's a shame. Uh, and I thought it was quite, uh, to me, it was quite clear. So that just means that I'm no longer really a beginner or uh, I'm, I'm used to all of these things. Uh, I have worked with it as well in the, in, in the Python world, you have the uh, virtual environments, which is sort of the same thing. And so I, I was quite uh, familiar with it. Um, I think the best way to, to really uh, learn this well, to properly learn, I don't think you can properly learn anything. The only thing you can do is uh, learn uh, just enough. And so what I uh, recommend you to do is to, um, is to start a new, new session, uh, a new project, and then uh, from the start, use, the, use RN and just uh, try it out. Uh, do the RN restore and do the RN um, uh, initialization. And then I think uh, it was my experience that the uh, uh, initialization was quite helpful and it gave you a lot of messages like, okay, I'm going to create a cache somewhere. Is that okay? And then you say yes or no. And then it starts to create the cache for you. And then uh, uh, these are the packages that I'm going to add. Is that okay? And then you type yes or no. And it just, so it's, it's a, step-by-step uh, -step process and it guides you through the through the story. So I think what you, you could do is, yeah, uh, create a new project, uh, make it very simple, make it just a, a plot, uh, maybe some, uh, if you're into the tidy first, maybe some uh, uh, deep layer and then some ggplot or something, create something, do the snapshot, and then um, uh, maybe copy it to a different location and open it again and then try the, uh, the restore, uh, the RN restore and see how it works out. I think the best way to learn is just doing it. Okay, so now we have a question about Docker. Can you have Windows inside Docker or is Linux the only option? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure. It's my, I believe that there's, that Docker is almost only Linux, uh, but maybe there is a Windows version, but I really don't know how well it plays with, uh, with, um, uh, with R. But what you can do is you can run Docker on Windows. So that's, that's all fine. Um, and, um, uh, there's even Docker images that have RStudio in them. And so you can start a session uh, with RStudio in it. And so it just works like the RStudio on your computer, but it's just in your web browser. Um, and yeah, uh, I would say don't be afraid of Linux. Um, 
there are some evil tech pros, but there are also very nice people uh, who will help you along the way. And uh, maybe you have to read a bit and maybe you have to, there are some times when you have to struggle a bit to figure out how does this work? Why doesn't it do what I want? But um, yeah, uh, there are, I haven't put, and I've put several Docker um, tutorials and resources into the, into the, um, uh, into this linked uh, GitHub, the running your R script in the cloud GitHub. And so uh, go through these and then you'll be, uh, I think I think you're dangerous enough uh, at that point, yeah. So is Grant necessary if you are doing, uh, if you are using Docker? This is a very good question. No, it's not, it's not necessary, uh, it can, make some of your work easier. So uh, the Rocker project, uh, which is the Docker project that has uh, uh, R specific versions, it also makes use of, um, so uh, yeah, one of the issues that you can have is that R packages change. And that happens all the time because people make new versions or fix bugs or whatever. But <clears throat> if you want to use an older version, then you have to find that older version. And so there is the, a thing that's called MRAN, the Microsoft CRAN, and it has a snapshot at times. Uh, so it has the CRAN as it was two years ago or three months ago or something like that. And so the, the Rocker containers actually make use of these old uh, snapshot. And so if you use a special uh, container or you use the container uh, specifically to version 3.4 or something, R3.4, then it will uh, also have access to the packages from that time. And so uh, it's not necessary to use RN to, to get this to work, um, but um, it can make some of your work a lot, lot easier. And it makes, uh, uh, if you use RN, then um, at least if, Cron updates just today while you're working on it, then you're still fine because you fix it into the version that you want. So it's not necessary, but it will help you. Thank you. So we have two remaining questions. Assume a customer trigger a cloud-based R script by example, filling out a form on a website can this R script be run simultaneously when the script gets triggered at the same time due to many users? Uh, this is a very good question. Yeah, so uh, if you use this um, uh, serverless or what's it called, um, function as a service uh, solution. Um, yeah, uh, I think the best thing you can do is look at the, uh, I don't, know if it was not YR conference, but it was the one uh, uh, from the guy from Microsoft. And he showed a wonderful example of serverless with R. I believe it's also in one of these links. But um, when you use serverless, uh, th this uh, function as a service, then um, this is able to scale out, that's what they call it. So if there are many requests, then, uh, it's pos then it will create new versions. Uh, new versions in parallel, and it will scale up to well to a certain limit. And so, if you have a form and you need to you want it to respond to form fillouts, then it can run simultaneously. Yes, it will run as many uh, as many instances as needed. So, in the Azure cloud, I think it limits to two hundred at the same time, or fifty at the same time, or something like that. But that's something you can you can modify. And in the the, the uh, Amazon cloud, it, there's uh, there are similar uh, issues, but uh, yeah, you can um, it can run simultaneously. Yes, in fact, mostly it's one response is one container. So if there's a new response and this one is is finished, then it will use the same one, and if it's not finished, then it will spin up a new one. So this is a very cool way to handle uh, loads. And so when no one is filling in these forms, then there are no containers. And so you don't pay for them as well. 
Thank you. So the last question, uh, there is a read ah. run function that is used to load dot r and run during the running r session. Right, so this is actually an answer to uh, one of the things that I said. So it is oh, possible okay. to just load the entire uh, uh, file again. Yeah. yeah so yeah, this yeah. is this is neat. I never uh, I never used it, and uh, I learned something new today. Pretty cool. Yeah, we have yeah. also other commands like thank scroll, read stuff, <laughs> deliver like a story. So thank okay. you very much, Lord, for this amazing talk. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Okay, the transmission.